Good day. A few days ago, I discussed an article written by the editorial team of the New York Times, which essentially called for Ukraine to resume negotiations with Russia and to agree a compromise peace with Russia, a compromise peace being one in which Ukraine would cede substantial territory in the east to Russia. Definitely Crimea, probably Donbass, now it seems to me inevitably Kherson and Zaporozhye regions as well. Now, the article I suggested was a sign of a change of mood in Western capitals, and we've now had dramatic confirmation of this at Davos, where the World Economic Forum is meeting, and where there have been angry recriminations and exchanges, and some extremely serious discussions and talks by various important people of the sort that get uh, invitations to speak at Davos. I'm going to come to that in a moment, but the first thing I'm going to say is that the reason there's been this dramatic change of mood is because of the situation, the military situation, on the ground in Ukraine. Now, I've been saying that about, about the last two weeks, ever since the important fortified town of Popaznaya was captured by the Russians and their allies, that the tempo of events is accelerating and there are now clear signs, clear indicators that Ukrainian resistance in northern Donbass is crumbling, that the Ukrainian forces there are starting to crumble. And yesterday we got more news of an accelerating Ukrainian collapse. Firstly, we've now learnt that the important Ukrainian town of Svetlodarsk has apparently been captured um, by the Russians after what appears to have been relatively limited fighting. This is, I think, the first instance that I know of where Ukrainian troops occupying a town and attacked by Russian forces, instead of standing f fast and fighting back and trying to defend the town, instead withdrew rather than face encirclement. This has provoked a number of questions, but you know we will come to that in a moment. I suffice to say now that I think that was a decision taken by the local commanders, perhaps without reference to Kiev. Elsewhere, the important town of Liman, which is on the way to uh, um, Slavyansk, uh, Slavyansk Kramatorsk being where the biggest remaining grouping of the Ukrainian army in Donbass um, is concentrated, um, the, important that, the important town of Liman um, began to be stormed by the Russians and their allies yesterday. Now, the Ukrainian force uh, which is located in Liman, numbering apparently between one and one and a half thousand men, apparently um, is trapped in the town, partly because the Ukrainians themselves blew up the bridges connecting Liman with Slavyansk. And the result is that they are st standing and they are putting up a fight, but apparently they've already been driven out, or they have been driven out, of some of the um, parts, of some of the areas of this town. It, population is around 20,000. So it's not, it's significantly bigger than just a village. Anyway, they've been pushed out of some of the, some of this town and apparently the expectation is that Liman will fall and presumably the Ukrainian group in Liman will either have to surrender or be destroyed at some point within the next few days. Elsewhere, um, the main Ukrainian grouping in northern Donbass, in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, is now facing a very critical situation. I said that at Svetlodarsk, the Ukrainians took the unusual decision of withdrawing from the town rather than letting themselves get encircled. In um, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, the decision has been the opposite. The troops there are increasingly under threat, or in fact, effectively encircled. It seems that the Russians have destroyed an important bridge connecting these two cities with, 
or at least connecting Lysychansk with Severodonetsk, meaning that the group, the Ukrainian force in Severodonetsk, said to number around 2,000, has essentially been trapped. But it seems that um, the whole grouping um, has been told to by the Ukrainian command to continue fighting. There have even bizarrely been attempts by Ukraine to reinforce it, to send more troops, many of them, as far as I can see, territorial defence troops, in other words, reservists, to this urban agglomeration, um, basically sending these troops into what is increasingly looking like a trap. And it is these events, this gathering collapse in northern Donbass, coming so soon after the collapse in the Azov Star factory in Mariupol, which I think explains the change of mood in the West. Now, I'm going to come to that in a moment, but that you can see that there's been a change of mood. You can get from the headlines that are now starting to appear. So I see, for example, this headline in the Daily Telegraph. The Daily Telegraph is a newspaper which has spoken, you know, talked up every Ukrainian battlefield success, even minor skirmishes have been reported there as major victories. And it has always deprecated every Russian success. So, you know, when it make, writes a headline like this, and the headline is Putin 25 kilometers from encircling elite Ukrainian unit in major Donbass victory, when the Daily Telegraph writes um, headlines like that, then you get a sense that the mood about the military situation has dramatically shifted. And it seems <clears throat> that the Daily Telegraph is taking this, its cue, from the British Minist Ministry of Defence. The British Ministry of Defence, for its part, is now also starting to speak of a deteriorating situation in uh, northern Donbass, deteriorating for the Ukrainians, that is to say. But in the case of um, the Daily Telegraph, I've no doubt at all that they're getting private briefings from Ministry of Defence officials. Uh, the Daily Telegraph is a conservative-leaning newspaper, and it's unsurprising, perhaps, that it's getting briefings from the British Ministry of Defence in a conservative of a conservative-led government, especially given that I suspect that the British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace may be eyeing his future, given that there's a high probability that Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, may fall, and he's no doubt anxious to keep the Daily Telegraph on side. But anyway, putting aside all of these political facts, as the fact that the Daily Telegraph is writing headlines like that, Putin 25 kilometers from encircling elite Ukrainian unit in major Donbass victory. Well, that tells us how the situation, the mood has darkened. Now, that comes alongside are now a whole flurry of articles which have appeared in the media, the British media, the American media, which are now talking about the need for Ukraine to compromise and I will just touch on a typical example. This is by Max Hastings in the London Times. He has said Ukraine must seek peace talks to have any hope of revival. And the passage underneath says the West should stop gloating over Russian losses and focus on a deal. Now, before I proceed, I'm going to say an important thing which needs to explain the context of all of these articles. Now, the official line uh, propagated across the West and, of course, propagated first and foremost in the British media is that Ukraine, until recently, until now, has been winning the war, that the Ukrainians have fought the Russians to a standstill, that they won a major victory outside Kiev, that they supposedly won a major victory outside Kharkov. The fact that the Ukrainian advance over the last few weeks in northeast Kharkov has gone into reverse has not been reported in the British media. Anyway, 
the reports that have been circulating and which the Western public has been informed about all speak of Ukrainian achievement, Ukrainian victory, Ukrainian success. And so far, the people who we're going to discuss who have been saying opposite things at, uh, in the New York Times, Max Hastings in this article in the London Times, the um, people we're talking about in the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos, they're all sticking with that line. At the moment, it's simply not acceptable to face up to the truth that instead of winning the war, Ukraine is actually losing the war and has, in my opinion, always been losing the war. To shift narrative so completely would be so abrupt and so jarring that nobody who wants to express an opinion and retain influence is prepared to make that shift. So the line that is being taken now is that despite its great victories, Ukraine needs to seek a compromise peace because to do otherwise might threaten the stability of Europe, might provoke Russia into even more extreme actions and might in some way endanger the peace of the world. Now, if you believe that, if you really believe that it is Ukrainian victories rather than Ukrainian defeats that are causing this change of mood, this shift towards requests for a negotiated peace, demands for a negotiated peace, well, I have a bridge to sell you. Because the reality is that if Ukraine was winning and really actually truly winning, it is inconceivable that people would be talking in this kind of way. They would all be coming out and they would be saying, well, you know, the Russians are getting a bloody nose. Let's go on supporting them until final victory, whatever that is, is achieved. On the contrary, it is because there is a growing understanding that nothing that about this affair is working out as expected, that you see this dramatic shift of mood. Now, the first thing to say is that, of course, we're talking about a war that has been waged in two ways. We have the economic war of attrition and we have the situation, the military situation. Now, before I go on to the economic war, uh, let me talk about, again, the military struggle. Now, it is essential to understand that though the West constantly says that the Russian plans have not worked out, the Russians have never told us what those plans are. They've never explained precisely what their military strategy in Ukraine is. And, of course, that is as it should be, because no general, no commander, no general staff with two brain cells to rub together announces its plans in advance. You have to infer them. And the thing about all Western commentary about the fact that the Russians supposedly wanted to storm Kiev, for example, is that it is based on inference. It is not based on actual knowledge of Russian plans. Now, I speak here with some confidence because if you followed our programs on the Duran and my own programs on this channel, I have always and consistently said that I didn't think that the Russians ever seriously planned to storm Kiev that their intention always was to focus on destroying the Ukrainian army. And, of course, the better part of the Ukrainian army is in Donbass. That has always been the focus of Russian battle plans. And that is what the Russians have been methodically and systematically doing. So, in my opinion, when the Russians say that things are going according to their battle plans, well, unsurprisingly, given that I have always believed that the destruction of the Ukrainian army in Donbass is Russia's main plan and focus, well, unsurprisingly, I think that is true. And I also think it is true that the Russians, when they say that their purpose in sending their troops outside places like Kharkiv and Kiev and Chernigov and all those places at the start of the war, was not to storm these places. In fact, if you go 
to Russian statements right at the start of the war, they were actually saying then that they had no plans to capture Ukrainian cities. There, there are actual official Russian statements from the Russian military saying as much. Well, anyway, if the Russians say that their purpose in, storm, in encircling or positioning troops around those cities was to pin Ukrainian troops there so as to allow the major Ukrainian grouping in Donbass to become isolated, to shape the battlefield, and then, as I said, to co focus on Donbass. Well, that accords with my own understanding of Russian military philosophies based on my historical reading, which I'm not going to pretend is massively extensive, but anyway, my own historical reading, and it is in fact what we see, and that is why I think that the Russians are probably telling the truth, when, or most of the truth, when they say that things are shaping up essentially in the way that they expected. But anyway, the important thing to understand is that the Russians have never shared their plans. Western claims about Russian military strategy are based on speculation and inference and guesswork. By contrast, when it comes to the economic war, the sanctions war that the West waged, launched against Russia in February, well, there we don't have to speculate because the United States government in particular and other Western governments told us what the plan was. The plan was to cripple the Russian economy. And when the sanctions were imposed on the Russian Central Bank, um, there were briefings from the White House, official briefings, even if carried out by our old friends, the anonymous officials, who said quite openly and quite frankly that the intention was to cause the ruble to go into free fall, to drain Russia's foreign currency, remaining foreign currency reserves, to create a high, a, an inflation crisis within Russia, to in effect cause the Russian economy to collapse. Well, that plan obviously has not worked. The ruble, instead of going into free fall, has strengthened. The Russians, far from seeing their foreign currency reserves drain as they've tried to support the ruble, seem on the contrary to be selling rubles in order to try to prevent the ruble from strengthening too fast. And inflation in Russia, after a spurt at the end of February and the beginning of March, is beginning to fall back. In fact, it's not beginning to. It is clearly falling back. And as I discussed in the recent program, there are clear signs, clear indicators that um, the problems in the real economy, the industrial sector, are beginning to resolve themselves, though we are likely to go on seeing a decline for several more months. So the West's economic plans against Russia, and these are the announced, the declared economic plans, have failed, whereas the Russian military plans, well, we don't for a fact know whether they've succeeded or failed, because we don't know what those plans are. I guess that they were to destroy the Ukrainian army, in which case they are succeeding, and that has been my guess all along. The West guesses that it was to engineer regime change and to capture Kiev, which I don't think there's ever any evidence for, and which, as I said, is contradicted by Russian statements. But that is, of course, the party line, the official line to which the West still has to adhere. Anyway, the reality, one way or the other, is that the Ukrainian army in Donbass is being destroyed. It is the best part of the Ukrainian army and the economic war, far from creating an economic crisis in Russia, is now 
increasingly looking as if it's going to create an economic crisis, not just in the West, but across the entire global economy. And that was unexpected and unplanned. It was not expected that the West would find itself in a long attrition war economically with the Russians. And it was not expected that it would result in an economic recession and crisis, one which obviously is causing the political leaders across the West who have to face increasingly distressed and angry electorates, one that is causing, as I said, e political leaders across the West increasing concern and trouble. So let's get on to what's happening at Davos. And here I'm going to uh, um, um, quote extensively from an article by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Daily Telegraph. And the article, the title of the article begins, Henry Kissinger, Ukraine must give Russia territory. Former US Secretary of State warns against the defeat of Putin as Western unity on sanctions phrase badly. And then he goes on to say as follows, and I'm going to read the entire article because it is symptomatic of the kind of shift in, it tells us the shift in mood that we're now seeing. Veteran US statesman Henry Kissinger has urged the West to stop trying to inflict a crushing defeat on Russian forces in Ukraine, warning, warning that it would have a disastrous consequences for the long-term stability of Europe. The former U.S. Secretary of State and architect of the Cold War rapprochement between the United States and China told a gathering in Davos that it would be fatal for the West to get swept away in the mood of the moment and forget the proper place of Russia in the European balance of power. Russia, Dr. Kissinger said the West, the war must not be allowed to drag on for much longer and came close to calling on the West to bully Ukraine into accepting negotiations on terms that fall very far short of its current war aims. Negotiations need to begin in the next two months before it contain, creates upheavals and tensions that will not be easily overcome. Ideally, the dividing line should be a return to the status quo ante. Pursuing the war beyond that point would not be about the freedom of Ukraine, but a new war against Russia itself. Kissinger told the World Economic Forum that Russia had been an essential part of Europe for 400 years and had been the guarantor of the European balance of power structure at critical times. European leaders should not lose sight of the longer term relationship, and nor should they risk pushing Russia into a permanent alliance with China. I hope the Ukrainians will match the heroism they have shown with wisdom, he said, adding that his famous sense, uh, with his famous sense of realpolitik, that the proper role of the, for the country is to be a neutral buffer state rather than the frontier of Europe. So here we see Kissinger. It's full of ambiguities. It's a typical Kissingerism. He may be an old man. He may be a man with no great moral centre. But he's both clever and he's clever in what he says. So he sticks, or seems to stick, to the party line, the official line that Ukraine is winning. He says, don't get swept along by the euphoria of the moment. When you actually unpack carefully the kind of things he's been saying, he says that it would have disastrous consequences for the long-term stability of Europe if the war is prolonged much further. And of course, what is most likely to have those disastrous consequences for the long-term stability of Europe, though he nowhere mentions it, is the gathering economic crisis. And, of course, the possibility of a comprehensive Ukrainian and, by extension, Western defeat in Ukraine. So he is warning about the failure of the economic war. He's for warning about the possibility of Ukrainian defeat, but he's packaging it to make it seem, even though he nowhere quite says, that what he's really warning against 
is about Russia. The one thing, the one point where he speaks clearly and where he speaks directly and to the point is about the great danger of posed by the Russian-Chinese alliance and the way that that is moving forward and that this is something that the West needs to think hard about. And when he talks about that the Ukrainians match heroism with wisdom, what he's basically telling the Ukrainians is, look, you are losing and you need to set, set down and face that fact and make peace. And note that he talks about Ukraine becoming a neutral buffer state rather than the frontier of Europe. In other words, Ukraine needs to drop any idea of it becoming a member of NATO. Well, that's Henry Kissinger. And of course, he's an old man. We don't know how influential he is anymore. My, m anymore. My guess is very influential. But then it becomes clear further on in the article that he speaks for a lot of others. To continue with the article, the comments came amid, amid growing signs that the Western coalition against Vladimir Putin is fraying badly as the food and energy crisis deepens and that sanctions may have reached their limits. And then we come to a very interesting section. We are seeing the worst of Europe, said German Vice Chancellor Robert Habeck in an angry outburst in Davos, accusing Hungary and other recalcitrant states of paralyzing attempts by the rest of the EU to craft a full-fledged oil embargo. Mr. Habeck, who doubles as economy, economy minister, said Germany is more or less ready to endure the shock of a total cutoff of Russian oil imports, but others want to carry on as if nothing had changed. I expect everyone to work to find a solution and not to sit back and work on building their partnership with Putin. So that's Robert Habeck, the green economics minister. Green, both in his politics and in his extreme lack of experience. He's uninterested in the economic realities. There must be some people in the German business community who are deeply troubled when they learn of these sort of comments that the economics minister is making. And of course, if people like Viktor Orban and other countries in Europe are trying to argue against an oil embargo, well, in Robert Habeck's uh, world, that's not because they are concerned about the livelihoods of their people. It is because they are somehow in league, in partnership with Putin. So that gives you a sense of um, still this extraordinary group, the Greens, the, grown, the Green leadership in Germany, the way it is still pushing and driving for more confrontation with Russia, the way it is, frankly, uninterested in the actual economic situation in Europe. Uh, it is almost indifferent to it. It is pursuing some kind of obsessive policy of attrition, economic war attrition against Russia, even at the price of German and European businesses and uh, European and German livelihoods. Then we hear this. Yuri Vitrienko, head of the Russian energy consortium Naftogaz, said the refuseniks are demanding exemptions from the embargo on false pretenses. What they really want is a free ride on discounted Russian oil. Eleven Republican senators and 57 congressmen in the US voted against the colossal $40 billion aid package for Ukraine an early sign of fragmented, co fragmenting cohesion in Washington. And then we have what is perhaps the most interesting section of all. Putin is counting on the West to lose focus, and that is our real challenge. People are as concerned or more concerned about the rising price of gas and groceries, said Chris Senator Christopher Coons. I'm not sure the unity will last. We may not get the vest next vote, said Eric Cantor, former House Whip and a key figure in the sanctions policy against Iran. 
Nobody is sure whether the U.S. is trying to punish Russia for its aggression or whether the goal is a subtler, subtler use of policy that gives the Kremlin a route of, out of sanctions if it changes course. The fundamental divisions over the West's war aims in Ukraine have so far been masked by an outpouring of solidarity and emotion, but these rifts are coming to the fore. President Zelensky delivered his usual tour de force in a video address to the forum, saying this is the year that when we learn whether brute force will rule the world. If it does, he added with his trademark touch, there will no doubt be no point in any more World Economic Forum in Davos. By the way, I should say that the Chinese delegation in Davos sat through Zelensky's comments in absolute silence. They didn't stand up and applaud him in contrast to some Western diplomats. Uh, Zelensky also said that in material terms, in terms of weaponry, his forces are outnumbered by the Russians 20 to 1. Well, we can <laughs> debate whether or not that is so. And of course, and predictably, he said that Ukraine is running out of weapons, as did his foreign minister, and needs more. So what the Ukrainians want is more of everything. And then it goes on to say, uh, 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 Ambrose Evans Brickshard goes on to quote him as saying, Zelensky is saying Russia should be shut out of the civilized world entirely. What is the civilized world? Europe? The world, apart from Russia? Or perhaps other countries in the world? Um, uh, um, or, or, or is it perhaps the case that other countries in the world that are not part of the collective West, are not civilised. It's an interesting comment, and one wonders quite what Zelensky means. I leave it to you, my viewers, to decide for yourselves. And then he goes on to say, and that all trade should stop until Russia for Russian forces are driven from Ukraine. Sanctions should be maximum so that Russia and every other potential ag aggressor that wants to wage a brutal war against its neighbours would clearly know the immediate consequences of their action. It is, that's Zelensky, and that's what Ambrose Evans Pritchard quotes him as saying. And then he, Ambrose Evans Pritchard goes on to say, it is doubtful whether the West can maintain a united front in pursuit of such far-reaching war aims with absolutist aims. Mr. Cantor said it would require se secondary sanctions against other countries, putting the West in a head-on clash with China, India and almost 60 states that refused to back a UN resolution denouncing Russia's invasion. India's energy minister, Sri Hardepuri, brushed aside suggestions that his country should stop buying Russian oil. The Europeans buy more e Russian energy in an afternoon than we do in a quarter, he said in Davos. That may be true, but it won't be true for much longer. Mr Cantor said the US was in danger of overplaying its hand. I have said in previous programmes that I think that is exactly what the United States has done. I said that if the United States had acted with more moderation back in February and had cashed in its winnings then, had not gone after the Russian central bank, had imposed the original sanctions which were planned and talked about before the war began, then it would have consolidated NATO and it would have become the winner. Instead, it waged this economic war against Russia. It sought Russia's military defeat in Ukraine. It has overplayed its hand and it is now risking a debacle in Ukraine and in Europe, which could weaken US credibility in the most important zone of its influence. So it's interesting for me to see that Eric Cantor also thinks that the US is in danger of overplaying its hand. There is a subtle difference. He says that they're in danger of doing it. I say that they've already done it. But anyway, to continue, we have got to have multilateral support. We are already being accused, this is Eric Cantor, former uh, chief, uh, former whip in the House of Representatives. We are already being accused of weaponizing the world's reserve currency. Even allies and friends are starting to ask 
if you are using it in this way, we too could one day be subjected to these sanctions. The US Congress is split on the ultimate war aim. Senator Manchin said the US should keep going until there was a clear win that restored all of Ukraine's territory and led to the toppling of Vladimir Putin. But other members of the congressional delegation in Davos want a negotiated peace. Now note that Ambrose Evans Pritchard doesn't mention who these people are and he doesn't say whether they're Democrats or Republicans. But it's interesting that he says that there are other members of the congressional delegation in Davos who want a negotiated peace. Saudi Arabia and the OPEC states have made it clear that they will not draw on their spare capacity to cover the lost Russian supply of oil, estimated at around 1 million barrels a day at the end of April. This makes it extremely hard to plug the gap if Europe cuts off purchases of Russian barrels. Francisco Blanche from Bank of America said the oil market is now extremely tight. The energy buffer is nearing a vanishing point. Crude oil inventories are down to a dangerously low point across Europe, North America and OECD Asia. Inventories have also fallen to precarious levels from mid middle dis distillates and even gasoline as the market heads into the peak of the US driving season. Unless there is a global recession and violent demand destruction, crude prices could soon spiral higher. We're not living in a dream world. We have to replace the lost oil with other oil, said Fatih Birol, head of the International Energy Agency. The, Mr. Birol said the OECD block of rich states are releasing $1.5 billion of oil to stabilize the market and have so far depleted 9% of stocks. That's just in a few weeks. This is before the European embargo against Russia even begins. This winter in Europe will be tough, he said. Who can doubt that these comments by Francisco Blanche from Bank of America and from Fatih Birol from the International en Energy Agency are addressed at the likes of Robert Habeck, who, as I said, shows no interest or concern about these matters. Anyway, what is absolutely clear is that instead of the triumphant victory lap that perhaps they expected at Davos, the recriminations instead have begun. The Western powers did not expect to be here. They assumed that the sanctions they imposed on Russia against its central bank back in February would by now have precipitated a massive crisis in Russia. They did not anticipate that, on the contrary, things would turn out so completely otherwise. And now the arguments and the recriminations have begun. You have people like uh, Robert Habeck, who demand more of uh, more sanctions. They want energy embargoes, oil embargoes. They want uh, um, war, à l'outrance, to the end, to the bitter end. Um, frankly, the way Robert Habeck speaks, I sometimes wonder whether he's the sort of person who would almost want a kind of World War Three scenario. I mean, he's words are so uncompromising, his attitudes are so uncompromising that um, I can't really see how he could ever agree to, he could ever agree to any kind of push, pullback, any kind of reverse. And to be straightforward about it, if we're going to see it, if, we, if, if something like that starts to happen, then there will have to be a change of government in Germany. And the Greens will have to stop being part of that government. And I suspect, by the way, that there's a fair chance in that case that they may never be in government in Germany again. But anyway, that's Robert Habeck. And then you have the other people, realists like Henry Kissinger, or at least practitioners of Realpolitik, people like um, Eric Cantor and um, others, um, other, uh, um, others, um, other more um, 
um, better informed people um, coming back, uh, uh, like Senator Coons. They're coming along and saying, look, even in the United States, political unity around this is fracturing. And we hear that even within Congress now, there are people who are talking about a negotiated peace. And, of course, we hear the industry leaders, people from Bank of America, people from the International um, Energy Agency, all coming out and saying, well, in effect, an oil embargo is madness. We're going to face an incredibly difficult winter if we take this route. We've got to stop. We've got to talk peace. We've got to accept that realities are not as we imagine them to be. So, this argument has now begun. To be absolutely clear, at this moment in time, it is Robert Habeck in Germany, who still, and people like him in Europe, in the European Commission, uh, um, who are continuing to be in the ascendant. Far from scaling back their support from Ukraine, all the indications are that instead they want to intensify it. We've heard reports now, for example, that whilst the Pentagon has refused to supply Harpoon anti-ship missiles to um, Ukraine, that Denmark has agreed to, has decided to do so, presumably stripping away its Harpoon missiles from its warships, looking to buy Harpoon missiles from the United States, sending them to the uh, Ukrainians so that the Ukrainians can take shots at the Russian Navy with them. Something, of course, which the Russians are fully aware of and something which the Russians will be able to counter. Anyway, we see all that those people are still in the ascendant, just as it is, I think, a given that tomorrow, 25th of May, the United States is going to... Uh, uh, is going to refuse to renew the Russian finance ministry's license, which will enable the Russians to continue to make dollar payments to US investors who bought Russian bonds. It's going to try and prevent them from buying, from, uh, uh, it's going to try to prevent the Russians from paying these bonds in dollars. I will call this a default, though I can't really see how Realistically, it can be called the default, though no doubt the credit agencies will say that it is. But anyway, that's the situation that we're now in. We're starting to see Western unity fray. It's known that some Western governments, Italy, for example, which has put together a completely hopeless peace plan, by the way, but nonetheless it's a kind of peace plan which tries to set out some negotiating positions, we see that some Western governments are now starting to become increasingly concerned, some Western politicians are starting to become increasingly concerned, and industry and leaders are now beginning to worry as well. If the military situation in Ukraine continues along the trajectory it is going, if we see a comprehensive Ukrainian military defeat in Donbass, if we see the collapse of the Ukrainian army in Donbass, if we also start to get to see oil prices rise, energy shortages intensify, we hear that President Biden is now releasing diesel from the US's strategic reserve to try to make up for shortages in diesel prices, diesel costs, if we're going to see rail strikes in Britain, if we're going to see other things starting to happen across the global economy, well, it could be that by autumn, the mood will shift even further towards some kind of compromised peace. But make absolutely no mistake, if the West seeks a compromised peace in the autumn, in Ukraine, the danger is that they may find that at that point, the Russians, victorious in Donbass, as they are likely to be, perhaps extending their control in Ukraine even further than the Donbass lines. There's now increasing talk, as I speculated a few days ago, that the next Russian target is going to be the important industrial city of Zaporozhye in southeast Ukraine. 
if that is indeed what starts to happen, if the West is in real economic crisis, then the Russians may be in an uncompromising mood and they might make much tougher demands than they might if the, West, if the Ukrainians and the West sat down and talked peace now. Of course, the prospects of anything similar to what was discussed in Istanbul being revived, I would have said, are non-existent. Anyway, that's where we are, as it seems to me today, with this situation. Um, we'll see how things shape out over the next few weeks and months. As I said, for the moment, all the indications are that it is the, the um, hardliners, the neocons in, Euro in the United States and their fellow travellers in Europe, people like the Robert Habeck and Baerbock, that it is they who remain in the ascendant. We will see how much damage these people do before sense and reason finally prevail, if, of course, they ever do. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon in future programmes on this channel. And um, remember, you can join us on other platforms, um, on Rumble and Locals. And of course, if you're watching this video and our other videos on Rumble, if you go to the top of the video and press the red maroon button, that will take you directly to our Locals homepage, where you can join our Locals community, participate in my uh, Wednesday live streams, which take place exclusively on Locals every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time, 1900 hours London Time. You can also, um, of course, if you join us on Locals, publish your own exclusive content, read the exclusive content that is published there. And you can also join us on other platforms as well, on um, the new free speech platform, SuperU, on um, Odyssey. Um, we've got a wonderful, thriving Telegram channel. You can follow us on all of these. And you can also support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. Um, and you can also go to our shop. You can buy the amazing things that we have there. Our magic mugs, including our famous Good Day mugs, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, our hats, our hoodies, our bomber jackets, and all the rest. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button, and please also check your subscription to this channel. That's enough from me today. Thank you for joining me again today. Um, I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a very good day until then.